All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, I want to welcome to you to welcome you to our talk tonight about Birmingham's connection to the Underground Railroad. Uh, I'm Donna, and I am joined tonight by Justin, and uh, we're from the Birmingham Museum uh, right here in Birmingham, Michigan. Uh, and tonight we're going to be talking about the stories of George and Eliza Taylor and Elijah Staunton Fish. Uh, these two men have just recently been recognized by the National Park Service as part of the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. So they were originally recognized on March 29th, 2022. Um, and uh, tonight we're going to actually explore their lives through the research done to find them. Uh, so this is a little bit different than, a, uh, than just a biographical account. We're gonna be taking you kind of behind the scenes and giving you a glimpse into the research that was done to find more about these men and how they are Birmingham's connection to the Underground Railroad. Now, we do want to uh, thank some volunteers here. Uh, we're very grateful for these, uh, for all the volunteers who've worked uh, tirelessly on this, on this uh, project. Uh, a large part of tracking down these um, stories uh, was thanks to George Getchman and Jackie Pat. Now, without the help of volunteers and the friends of the Birmingham Museum, uh, especially the story of George and Eliza Taylor probably would have remained unknown to us here at the museum without these two. Um, and so now we're going to start at the beginning with George and Eliza Ta Taylor's story and how we, with the help of George and Jackie, uncovered their connection uh, to the Underground Railroad and their connection to Birmingham. Okay, so well, when it comes to George and Eliza Taylor, uh, ironically enough, to start at the beginning of how we found out about them, we need to start at the end of their lives. And this is because uh, George Getchman first brought to our attention the obituaries of George Taylor and Eliza Taylor. Uh, George's obituary was on the front cover of the Birmingham Eccentric uh, from November 8th, 1901. And Eliza's obituary was on the front cover of the April 25th, 1902 issue of the Birmingham Eccentric. So the, the obituaries had both explicitly stated that both of these individuals had been born into slavery, George being born in Kentucky and Eliza being born in Tennessee. Now, while both had been formerly enslaved people, their paths to freedom and to Michigan and Birmingham specifically were quite different. So George had escaped from slavery via the Underground Railroad, and with a great deal of courage and determination and a good amount of luck, George found his way to southeastern Michigan. And it was also stated that George had been a resident of the area beginning roughly 43 years before his death, but quote, with the exception of 12 years, which he had spent in Kansas. Now keep a little note of that, the Kansas thing, because we're going to come back to that in a moment. So on the other hand, uh, it is stated that Eliza was granted freedom, quote, at the close of the war. Now this is obviously referring to the Civil War. And she soon decided to go and search for her mother, whom she had been separated from when Eliza was sold away as a young child. Now, this search eventually led Eliza to Royal Oak, where she would cross paths with George Taylor sometime after. And once this information was brought to the museum's attention, courtesy of George Getchman, the museum was quite, quite excited to see what else could be found on the couple. And just a little side note before we move on, uh, both the obituaries you had seen on your screen just now had been pretty heavily manipulated in Photoshop just to make them readable. Uh, the original scans are what you see right now. And as you can see, they are pretty much impossible to read in their entirety just without trying to bring out the words. So that's, a, that's always fun to do that. All right, but after taking uh, what information was present in these obituaries, the next step for us was to do a search for any official state documents that were pertaining to George and Eliza. Now, in other words, this was a way in which we could confirm at least some of the information from the obituaries, so we would have more than one source of information on these two individuals. And the best way for us to do this, it was through Ancestry.com, which I cannot understate this. This is an incredibly valuable resource for us here at the museum. And in the case of the Taylors, uh, this search through Ancestry.com led us to their censuses and their death certificates. And the death certificates are what you see on the screen right now. Now, through these documents, we were able to confirm that the Taylors uh, had lived in Southfield and eventually Birmingham, though we were unable to find their exact location during their time in Kansas. That's, and that's because the 
1890 census records had been destroyed, uh, have been destroyed decades ago in a, in a pretty unfortunate fire. So we weren't able to get our hands on those. Uh, additionally, the death certificates contained the names of the parents of both George and Eliza. We were also able to confirm that Eliza's mother was named uh, Matilda Kaysen, whom we then confirmed to have been found in Royal Oak. So this added a connection to the obituaries, which was very exciting for us. So now that we had confirmed George and Eliza had been residents of Birmingham at the time of their deaths, the next step was to attempt to find out exactly where their house was located. And to do this, we first needed to figure out which plot of land the Taylors had owned. Now this could be accomplished by using their census information to determine when they were living in Birmingham and then by cross-referencing with the Birmingham tax records. So, and the, the idea of utilizing the tax records uh, actually came to the museum courtesy of a local historian named John Marshall. And he was the first to do so. He brought that method to our attention. And by looking at the Birmingham tax records for the year 1894, John Marshall and by extension, the museum were able to find an entry labeled quote, you can see it at the top left right there, Taylor Geo. Now that means obviously George Taylor. And this entry in the Birmingham tax records, like. Justin, your volume was, your volume's off. Oh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> How long was that? How long was that off? <laughs> Um, you just, just by uh, the entry in the Birmingham tax records is the one you see across the top of the slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm, that was weird. <laughs> All right. So yes, like, like Donna just said, the Birmingham tax record entry is the one that you see right across the top of the screen right there. And it's a little difficult to read, but the second column says hoods edition lot nine. And as this map from 1896 around the right side of the screen shows, uh, that would place the Taylor lot on Stanley street. And originally the museum, we had made the educated assumption that the Taylors had lived on Bates, not Stanley. And the reason for this was because we, when we were looking at the route that the census taker had taken when doing the census for the year 1900, it, he was originally going down Bates Street and then he veered off onto the Taylor property, which was on Stanley Street. And incidentally enough, uh, the person doing the, the census taker in the year 1900 was a man named John Allen Bigelow. And if any of you were here last month for our war stories uh, presentation, you will recognize him because he was featured fairly prominently in that, in that presentation. So with John Marshall's assistance, uh, the, the assumption that the Taylors had lived on Bates Street had been corrected. We now knew that they lived on Stanley Street. And additionally, an article in the January 18th, 1894 edition of the Birmingham Eccentric, which you can see on the bottom left there, stated, quote, George W. Taylor bought Fred Smith's home in the south part of the village and has moved into it. And by looking at the tax records for both 1892 and 1893, we were able to confirm that a person named Fred Smith had previously owned the plot designated as Hood's Edition Lot 9 before selling it to the Taylors. So all of this information had confirmed to us that both the Taylors had in fact uh, owned property and did pay taxes in Birmingham. So now that we now that we knew which plot of land they lived on, the the next step for us was to try to find the exact location of the house itself, at least where it would have been. And this was necessary because many of the plots of land that were shown on that 1896 map from the last slide, uh, they'd be those a lot of those lots would be subdivided further in the decades to come because they were a lot bigger than what what they are now. And thankfully, by 1921, the plot. The, the Taylor's plot specifically had not been cut to pieces quite yet. And so by looking at the uh, map from 1921 that you see here on the screen, it's been blown up a little on the left there. You can see that there's a little drawing there. Uh, if you look by the red arrow, there's a drawing there of a house and a little shed also denoted uh, with the number nine. And this, this was supposedly the house that they had lived in. Now, although the Taylor's had not resided in the house for nearly 20 years, uh, when this map, when this map was first created, after examining all the evidence that we had available to us in the tax records, uh, museum staff, we were able to make an educated guess, and we can confidently state that the house depicted on this map was very likely to have been the Taylor's original home, listed on the map here as five two three Stanley. Uh, however, this house that you see here on the map was torn down and a new one was built in its place in 1923. 
and the house that was built in 1923 happens to be the one that stands there today. Now, moving on, uh, if any of you are like me, you probably think it'd be pretty cool to know like exactly where the Taylor's house would have stood if it was still, if it still existed today. And after 1922, like I, like I mentioned before, this is the time when the plots would be further subdivided and then renumbered. And that's what this would result in the map that you see in front of you here. And it's, it's right there on the left side of your screen. Now, Hood's edition plot nine, as it had been referred to previously, had been divided into three different sections labeled 607, 627, and 635 Stanley, which is highlighted right there by that red rectangle. And it has remained that way to this day. So therefore, based on all the evidence that is available to us here at the museum, it seems very likely to us that the Taylor House once stood on the plot of land that is now 607 Stanley Boulevard. And you can see that exact location on the modern day Google Maps on the right side of your screen right there. So after finding out all of this information about the Taylors and in the process of doing that, confirming a lot of the information that was present in the original obituary, we then set out to find the graves of both George and Eliza. And we did this because the obituaries had both explicitly stated that both George and Eliza had been buried in Greenwood Cemetery. Now, these graves uh, turned out to be unmarked, but by examining the burial records for Greenwood Cemetery, which you can see uh, at the top and the bottom of the screen here, we were able to deduce the exact location for the graves. And when I say exact, I mean exact because they it, it's a little hard to read, but they go into like measurements down to the down to feet, telling you exactly where they are. And so both George and Eliza are buried beside one another in section E of Greenwood Cemetery. Now, having found out this, found the final resting, resting place for George and Eliza, uh, we felt it appropriate to commemorate the two in some way. So for Juneteenth in 2021, so Juneteenth of last year, well, flowers were placed on the grave locations to honor the two. And ever since the story of the Taylors had come to light here at the museum, it really didn't sit right with us that their graves remain unmarked. And so thankfully, the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Friends of the Birmingham Museum decided to raise funds with the goal of giving the Taylors the grave marker that they deserve. Now, the initial goal for this campaign was only $7,000, but in total, more than $17,000 was donated by people from all over the United States and not just Birmingham specifically. So while museum staff here at the museum were occupied with searching the archives and collections and scouring for more information on the Taylors, as well as dealing with all the lockdowns and all that stuff due to COVID, uh, George Getchman took the liberty of looking into George Taylor's connection to Southfield. And he subsequently came across the story of Reverend James Milligan, who was a minister for the Southfield Reformed Presbyterian Church in Southfield, Michigan. He had been involved in the Underground Railroad in Pennsylvania and Ohio, and he was very active here in Oakland County as well. And in 1895, he wrote a letter of his account to Wilbur H. Siebert, an historian who wrote the book that's titled The Underground Railroad from Slavery to Freedom, which was published in 1898. So here are Milligan's own words on his work in Southfield, Michigan. Quote, I was first settled as pastor in Southfield, Michigan, 16 miles from Detroit, in a good but retired community of people, mainly abolitionists, and had in my house or in my congregation always a supply of escaped slaves. They would come to Detroit from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri, sometimes singly, sometimes in groups from two to 10, into the keeping of the faithful, who either sent them to me or to Canada for shelter and employment. They frequently returned to me from Canada when wages were low and workers super abundant. Slave hunters often came clear to Detroit in pursuit of valuable slaves. J. Sella Martin, a slave from Alabama, was pursued to Chicago and then to Detroit, an award of $1,000 offered for his capture. He was six weeks in my house and was the smartest man I had ever met. He afterward became a very eloquent Baptist minister in Boston. So George Gutchman uh, had followed Reverend Milligan's travel travels, and in doing this, uh, it had led him to a city in Kansas, which is now known as Denison, so Denison, Kansas. 
And in doing this, he discovered that both Reverend Milligan and George Taylor were both deeply connected in some way to the Denison Reform Presbyterian Church. And a picture of that church you can see right there at the bottom right of the screen. Now, if you remember from the original obituary for George Taylor that was shown at the beginning of the presentation, you might recall that I told you to remember a little note about how George had lived in Michigan for most of his later years, except for a stretch of roughly 12 years where he had lived in Kansas. Now, this was yet another exciting connection we were able to draw with George Taylor and his obituaries from, from when George Gutschman gave them to us. Now, George Getchman was able to speak to Mitzi Van Horn of the Denison Reform Presbyterian Church, and Mitzi was very gracious and gave us all of the information that they had on George Taylor and his role in bringing Reverend Milligan's family to, to Kansas. And as it, it turns out, Reverend Milligan first traveled to Denison alone from, he, they both started in Southfield, but Reverend Milligan first departed alone to Denison, and, and he did this to begin preparatory work for the forming of the church in Denison. Now, before um, now, at some point, Milligan had entrusted George Taylor with the incredibly important duty, and this mean, I mean very, very, very important duty, of accompanying Milligan's family on their journey to Kansas once they were ready to leave, and to ensure that, th that his family had reached Denison safely. Now, we also found out that George Taylor was the first and only formerly enslaved person to become a member of the Denison Reform Presbyterian Church. And also, it was discovered that George Taylor had donated a clock to the church prior to his departure from Kansas back to Michigan, which you can see in the picture at the top right of your screen right there. So while this information about George Taylor in Kansas was being unearthed, Jackie Pat, uh, who was mentioned earlier at the beginning of the presentation, was another incredibly helpful volunteer for us, was working on finding out info on people buried in Greenwood Cemetery. And during her research, she came across a first person account of George Taylor's escape from enslavement, which was detailed in the Birmingham eccentric. Now, before we dive into the set into this little section about George Taylor, I, d I do just want to give another big thank you to Jackie for doing the painstaking work to find this firsthand account, because um, some of you may know the Birmingham eccentric is available for viewing online, but it's not searchable. So you, there's no search bar where you could hypothetically type in George Taylor and have everything pertaining to him be brought right to you. So in order to find something like this, if you don't know that it's already there, you literally have to go through the grueling process of reading every single page one by one to try to find what, something on the subject that you are looking for. And without people like Jackie uh, that are willing to do this type of, this type of thing, uh, this type of information on George Taylor might not have ever been found. All right, so the article titled Two Good Old Souls by Ed Jarvis was printed in 1898. The information in George Taylor's account of his escape helped us locate where he was held in bondage and his route north. It states in the article, quote, George Taylor was born a slave in Hancock County, Kentucky, 73 years ago. He was the property of a Mrs. Great House. He was not treated very kindly but did not rebel until he was 31 years old. Having been subjected to a public whipping at the time, however, he decided to make his escape at the first opportunity. So this information gave us information and a name uh, that we could look up in the census records. And it was, re oh, sorry. And it was revealed that the family by the name of Great House did live uh, right on the Ohio River in K Hancock, Hancock County, Kentucky, and that Elizabeth Greathouse was the only woman Greathouse listed as a slaveholder on the slave registers. We also found in the probate records of her husband, uh, who died in 1832, the name of a young enslaved man named George, who matched the right age of George Taylor, uh, as what George Taylor would have been in 1832. And that's uh, this little insert right here, the top left. Um, and here's a little side note that I want to add here because it's, it's very interesting. But right here where you see the big red great house, right here where this little yellow line is, is actually just three miles, 
It was the ferry landing that Abraham Lincoln and his family used to leave Kentucky for Indiana in 1816. And when Lincoln was a, a little bit older, uh, but still quite a young man, uh, he actually uh, made money by ferrying people back and forth between Kentucky and Indiana, just three miles from the Great House uh, Cemetery. Um, now, of course, this was long before George Taylor fled, uh, but I thought I thought it was a very interesting connection and wanted to share that to you. Uh, but the rest of the account continues with, quote, a brother ferried him across the river to the Indiana side. He traveled for two weeks at night only using the North Star as his guide. Then he decided, because of the slow progress he was making, that he must travel by daylight. Now began his troublesomes in earnest. Overcome by weariness one afternoon, he fell asleep in some bushes near the roadside, awakening to find himself prisoner of two men. The men were accompanied by bloodhounds, but Taylor took a desperate chance and made a break into the bushes. The shots his captors fired after him went wide, but the dogs were hot on his trail and he narrowly escaped being recaptured while beating them off. He then traveled for five days without food and was nearly dead from hunger and exposure when he was found by an abolitionist who kept him until he had recovered his strength. Two days after he left this refuge, he was run down by bloodhounds and the dogs holding him until their owners came up and placed him under arrest. Fortunately, he was taken before a justice whose sympathies were with the abolitionists and, his, and he ordered his release. Finally, after many more thrilling experiences, he reached Niles, from which he was hurried to Detroit and then across the river, river to Windsor, having been on the road for four weeks. As soon as it was safe to do so, Mr. Taylor came back to the United States and has lived in this section ever since. Now, from this account, we know he made it to Niles, Michigan, and was placed in the care of uh, conductors or abolitionists to Windsor, where he gained his freedom before returning to Southfield, Michigan. And at the very end of the article, it is known, noted that in quote, in 1869, he was married to Mrs. Elizabeth Ann Dozier of Southfield. Mrs. Taylor was born into slavery in Tennessee. When she was 16 years old, she was sold to an Ab Alabama planter and twice afterwards, she was put on the block and sold to the highest bidder. After the war, she found her mother living in Royal Oak. She had not seen her for 22 years. So once George was free, once he had escaped successfully, uh, he lived and worked as a farmhand in Southfield. Uh, incidentally enough, he lived directly across the street from Reverend Milligan and also worked for Reverend Milligan during this time. And after the Civil War, uh, Eliza had located her mother in Royal Oak. And then sometime after well, these events had happened, George and Eliza met and eventually got married. Now, seeing as they were an older couple, they eventually made the decision to adopt a daughter, and they named this daughter Clara Blevin Taylor. Now, during the following years, the family would settle down and buy property in Birmingham, uh, as previously shown in the location that you saw earlier and they would become members of the United Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, and they would eventually welcome grandchildren. Now, in the same vein, uh, Clara would evidently lead us to a discovery of a larger network of African-American history in this area of Michigan. Though her, through her own journey, we discovered further connections between Royal Oak, Birmingham, and the surrounding areas. And this past February's library lecture uh, by our director, Leslie, uh, focused, on, focused on these families. And you can watch that lecture titled Black Families of Early Birmingham on our YouTube channel uh, from the city or from the city website if you want to know more. Now, personally for me, uh, it's, it's heartwarming to know that the Taylors were well liked in the community of Birmingham. And I know, and we know this because there are many instances on record of people referring to George as quote, Uncle George. And also there was the following quote from the front page of the Birmingham Eccentric on April 25th, 1902. And it sums it up quite well. Uh, quote, only last January, we were obliged to chronicle the death of our old friend, George B. Taylor. And on Tuesday, April 22nd, Mrs. Taylor followed him so that the venerable couple would only be separated only six months and 12 days. So I'm so personally, I'm glad that the Taylors were able to be part of a community that loved and cherished them in their final years, especially after escaping from the horrific conditions of slavery. And 
So overall, that is the timeline of how the incredible story of George and Eliza Taylor was put on our radar here at the museum. Now, interestingly, the Taylors are not the only example of people self-emancipating and then seeking refuge in southeastern Michigan. Other examples include people like John Anderson, who moved to Pontiac after his self-emancipation, who then later joined the army to fight in the Civil War. And another is Reverend George Newman, who would go on to become a Methodist minister in Pontiac after his self-emancipation. So why exactly did these people, among many others, seek refuge in Oakland County and the nearby areas? But what exactly did Oakland County and Birmingham offer these people and their families? Well, as it turns out, this area of Michigan, which includes Birmingham, Franklin, Pontiac, Southfield, and Oakland County as a whole, was quite a hotbed of activity for the abolitionist movement at the time. And being in such close proximity to Canada, where the Fugitive Slave Act's jurisdiction could not reach, this area would have likely been one of the last stops for anyone seeking to escape to safety across the border. Now, Birmingham's specific connection to this cause was an abolitionist deacon named Elijah Fish. So <laughs> when we started looking into George Taylor, we were not looking for abolitionists in Birmingham at the time, but uh, we kind of stumbled upon his activities by accident around the same time that we were researching George Taylor. Uh, Elijah Fish was best known to the museum, um, not because he was one of the first settlers, which he was in Bloomfield Township, building his house in 1820, but he was best known because he was the brother of Imray Fish, the man who committed the very first murders here in Oakland County. Of course, uh, we've done a lot of research on that, and you can learn more about that in our video on YouTube titled, The 1825 Utter Murders Revisited. That's our October 2021 library lecture with Commander Scott Gruy of the Birmingham Police Department and our museum director, Leslie. So we won't go into In My Fish today because it's about Elijah this time. But how we found Elijah was in 2020, we had done a post on our social media about the murders, and a question arose about how Imre was cared for after his verdict of insanity during the trial. In looking for information on Imre's incarceration as the first prisoner in the Pontiac jail, a few newspaper articles popped up on Elijah Fish's activities with the Oakland County Anti-Slavery Society. And his participation in the society was recorded in an 1877 biographical sketch of Oakland County, but this was about all that was known by the museum staff at the time. Uh, luckily, over the past few years, several grants have allowed for newspapers to be digitized and searchable on the Central Michigan University site. So more information on his involvement uh, came to light, including the fact that he was actually one of the founders of the Oakland County uh, Anti-Slavery Society. He worked alongside George Wisner of Pontiac, Nathan Powers of Farmington, and William Stone of Troy Township. Now, Wisner and Powers were already well-known ab abolitionists and were quite a vocal force for abolition in Oakland County uh, during their lives. So finding this information in the Pontiac Courier was quite encouraging, but it really didn't prove a connection to the Underground Railroad. Uh, it did, however, lead us to the rabbit hole that we eagerly jumped into. So with some creative thinking and looking beyond the first few pages of Google search, we did find Fish's name in a graduate program thesis paper on Henry Bibb, uh, the famous Detroit Windsor abolitionist who himself had escaped slavery from Kentucky in 1833 after his wife, who was also enslaved, was forced into prostitution by her slaveholder. His goal in seeking uh, freedom was to free his wife in the end. But from this reference in the Henry, uh, in the thesis paper about Henry Bibb, we were actually able to find Fish in the biography about Henry Bibb, which also named Fish as one of the founders of the Refugee Home Society. Uh, and this was a this was a big find because the society was supported by donations from American and Canadian anti-slavery groups, and this uh, society purchased land located around Windsor, Canada for resale to freedom seekers 
who had no personal property and lacked the means to buy land privately themselves. Each settler would receive 25 acres, five of which would be free if the land was cultivated within three years, and the remainder of which was to be paid for in nine installments. Uh, this actually did quite well, and one of the communities, the Buxton community, still exists today, and it hosts a homecoming um, every Labor Day for descendants. Uh, last year, I was doing a talk in uh, the the Oakland the Oakland County uh, Fair, uh, and one of the descendants actually came up and told me about this homecoming, uh, and was like, "Everybody's invited. Uh, there's a museum and a school on the site, and there's tons of information regarding the newly freed settlers that set, settled in Buxton after gaining their freedom." Uh, so, if you ever plan a trip to to Windsor, that's a fun place to go. Um, but after reading the biography, uh, we searched for the paper that Bibb had published in Sandwich, Canada, called Voice of the Fugitive. Again, luck was on our side. Uh, they had recently digitized the paper. And though it was not fully internet searchable, it was page searchable using OCR, which is optical character recognition. It's basically a computer translation. So though OCR can provide challenges, like interpreting fish as tish, ish, and shish. So when I say we got creative with searching through Google, uh, you kind of have to throw in like, so how would a computer interpret this name? Uh, so it was prudent though, because of so many of the different ways that it was interpreted uh, to look at other criteria per page. So we also used Birmingham and Oakland. Uh, and during the page by page search, um, however, the paper went offline. Um, now this gave a little panic, a little panic attack on my part. Um, but a few phone calls later and a nice chat with the archivist in Sandwich, which I want to thank, um, I was given access to the paper during their transition um, to the to the new server. So <laughs> uh, definitely you want to, you know, it's more than just a Google search. It's, I think what we're trying to say through this whole this whole talk is is you have to reach out and talk to people and talk to archivists and talk to other historians and, uh, you know, talk to to church receptionists, um, but uh, the voice of the fugitive is where we struck gold. Um, so the proof that we needed, oh, yeah, this is, uh, this is the paper uh, where we found the very first mention of fish uh, and the um, uh, refugee home society. So uh, it was through the University of Chicago um, and there's a wonderful picture of Henry Bibb from one of his autobiographies. So here's the voice of the fugitive. This is where we struck gold. So the proof we needed that Fish was directly contributing to those seeking freedom uh, and putting his own freedom on the line. One of the reasons it is so hard to find information uh, in the United States on these abolitionists, and one of the reasons we had to go to Canada, is that abolitionists who work directly with the Underground Railroad um, were breaking the law. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 uh, made it illegal to help freedom seekers in any capacity on their journey towards Canada. Uh, and one of the punishments uh, was imprisonment for those found to be helping freedom seekers. Uh, so it could get quite dangerous to offer support. But here are the articles describing the contributions of Elijah Fish and of Birmingham as a society as a whole, uh, and also uh, Fish's involvement in the Refugee Home Society. Okay, so the first the first article is from March 15th of 1851, uh, titled Help for the Fugitives, and it says, quote, we would also thankfully acknowledge a small lot of clothing and provisions which H.B., Henry Bibb, received from the hands of Deacon E. Fish of Birmingham, Oakland County, collected by him from the Friends of Humanity for the same object in that town. Most of the lot have already been distributed to relieve the actual want among the destitute. Now the next one is from April 23rd of 1851, also titled Help for the Fugitive. We have just received from the store of Halleck and Raymond a small lot of clothing for their comfort with $1. 
These things were collected and sent here by Deacon E. Fish of Birmingham, Oakland County. The same individual collected last winter and sent here a lot of things for the same purpose with $3 in money, which was thankfully received by the needy and applied for the use intended. Now this last one here, which is at the right side of your screen, is from June 4th of 1851, uh, titled Refugee Home Society. Pursuant to a call, the anti-slavery friends in Michigan met in Detroit at the City Hall on the 21st to consider the subject which had called them together. At half past 10 o'clock a.m., the House was called to order by Reverend C.C. C. Foote of Commerce, at which time the following officers were elected by the meeting. Deacon E. Fish of Birmingham, President. Robert Garner, Vice President. Reverend E.E. E. Kirkland of Colchester, Secretary, and William Newman, Assistant Secretary. So with this information about the work with Henry Bibb and with the Refugee Home Society, we had, required, we had the required information to apply for the designation for the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom for Elijah Fish. But with so many well-known names listed from Powers and Stone mentioned earlier to Robert and John Gardner of White Lake and Reverend Swift of Nankin Township, there was no leaving this rabbit hole. Um, there was a lot more still to discover. Uh, and after a bit more digging, we came across a mention of an Eliza Ish from Birmingham in an abolitionist newspaper uh, published in Ann Arbor called The Signal of Liberty. This paper carefully hid names of those who were active within the Underground Railroad, but openly commended those who sat on committees and worked at, at different anti-slavery societies throughout the state of Michigan. The paper also covered the state conventions and proposed anti-slavery candidates for election. Now, Fish, Powers, Win Wisner, and Stone were very active at both the local, county, and state level. And Fish even organized assemblies in Birmingham that featured speakers like Henry Bibb and Seymour Treadwell, another well-known abolitionist. Uh, this is a notice here um, on the speakers, Mr. Tread Treadwell and Bibb for Wednesday, August 19th in 1844. In another uh, article uh, at a rally for universal liberty and equal rights, Fish announced in the paper that T. Merrill, another Birmingham resident, had liberally granted use of his mechanics hall for one of the talks. So it wasn't just Fish uh, working toward uh, the betterment um, for the freedom seekers. Uh, it seems like Birmingham uh, was, was quite involved as kind of a whole. But I do wanna take uh, to make a note here that uh, this was very dangerous at times to take up the abolitionist cause. Uh, there were people, even in heavily abolitionist counties, that were violently opposed to the end of slavery. One instance that happened at an anti-slavery society meeting uh, in Pontiac in February of 1837 saw the meeting broken up by an S.N. Gant from Ohio, who came in armed with a group of men, and he started to brandish a, quote, naked dirk, uh, which is a type of Spanish knife. Uh, others gathered outside the Baptist church in which the meeting was held, and they started to throw stones through the windows. Now, George Wisner, uh, who had no problem um, being very vocal and sometimes very violent of his own, uh, apparently took on Gant and was slightly injured, but the protesters were subdued. The Pontiac Courier uh, gave a very long but exciting account of the interaction in their February 13th, 1837 paper, uh, which you can see quite long. <laughs> uh, this is just one instance of violence against the abolitionists. Uh, another one in 1843 saw Reverend Swift of Nankin Township, who worked with Elijah Fish on the Refugee Home Society, lose his house to what was deemed a, quote, suspicious fire about the same time that the Nankin Mill burned down. Swift was a known abolitionist at the time, working with Henry Bibb, and though it was only rumored, it was believed that the fires were intentionally set because of the work uh, and the involvement with the Underground Railroad. In 1848, uh, the Signal of Liberty newspaper uh, moved to Battle Creek and was renamed the Michigan Liberty Press uh, and 
But within a year of its move, pro-slavery supporters actually attacked the press and the building and burned all of it down, destroying the entire operation. So uh, we don't have uh, a, a lot of those um, newspapers were, were destroyed. So uh, obviously we can't uh, search them now. So along with uh, just the local area, um, there were many other references that were found about Birmingham in general uh, being open to the anti-slavery movement, including the mention uh, in a Boston paper in 1858 in an article written by Black abolitionist William Cooper Nell. Nell talked uh, of his trip through Michigan, including his stay uh, with Milligan of Southfield and his talk at the Crowded Academy here in Birmingham. Interestingly enough, in Martha Baldwin's diary, she mentions going to see the speaker in a week after sitting in on a talk by Deacon Fish. So one week she went to see Fish and the very next week she was sitting in uh, listening to uh, Nell. By this point, we definitely had more than enough evidence to show that Fish deserved recognition for his contribution to helping freedom seekers on their journey to Canada. And there may still meet more, be more out there uh, waiting to, you know, for us to find it. Um, but it needs to become available uh, to researchers through digitization, uh, which is something that we're working on in our museum as well. But for Fish, his story ended before he saw his labors come to fruition. Elijah Fish passed away on February 28th in 1861 just before the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. He did not see his work to end slavery accomplished, but his children continued his fight. Uh, he had several sons had to uh, Kansas uh, to work on the Free Kansas Project and work within the government there. And his son, Henry, who joined the 123rd New York Regiment during the Civil War, made the ultimate sacrifice on December 8, 1863 in Louisville, Kentucky. Now, slavery officially ended December 6, 1865, with the ratification of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Now, in 1888, uh, his daughter, Fanny Fish, wrote an article for the Pontiac Pioneer Society about growing up in Birmingham. The last paragraph gives details to the person that was Elijah, J, Elijah S. Fish. We are going to give you an historic language alert here for the following quote from 1888. Some references uh, within may be found objectionable, but we're going to give the quote in its entirety for the purposes of historic context and authenticity. This reflects the attitudes of the people at the time. So quote, the particular characteristics which secured to him so many friends and made so few, if any, enemies are hard to define in words. Self-love and self-esteem had small place in his makeup. He had a keen sense of humor and enjoy enjoyed a joke, even at his own expense, perpetuated by the other fellow. Perhaps to this appreciation and hearty recognition of the other fellow, he owed some of his popularity. Indeed, the other fellow, whether he was the Negro slave toiling at his unrequited task, the red man cra being crowded off his hunting ground, the drunkard struggling with his growing appetite, his wife bearing the burdens that come to such lives, or the poor widow trying to bring up her little brood respectively, occupied a large space in the thoughts and sympathies of Elijah S. Fish. The epitaph on his grave in Greenwood Cemetery reads, a useful life and peaceful death is the epitome of his history. So that is the end of our talk, and I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and uh, finding out a little bit more about Birmingham's connection to the Underground Railroad. Um, now, we would like to um, take questions and let you do know that uh, if, if you want to, you can see this. Uh, the vi video will be available soon on the YouTube channel, the Birmingham Museum with exclamation point. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. It's Diane. I might just, just let you know that the man 
for the Southfield Church was on the corner of Evergreen and 12 Mile. And that's where the slaves would actually be held while they were being transported elsewhere. And the other uh, thing just to make note of, the Fugitive Slave Act, actually the grounds for it are in the fourth article of the Constitution. And the first Fugitive Slave Act was shortly after the adoption of the Constitution. The one that uh, comes about in the 1850s is because of the Adam uh, Crossway incident in Marshall, which created quite a ruction, as we all know. Uh, my question, though, is given how close Detroit and the suburb area is to uh, Windsor, or you can skedaddle up to Fort Huron, which many did, what on earth would, other than his friendship with um, Reverend Milligan, why would someone want to go from an area near the border to Kansas? Well, that's a good question. Um, so we don't have any actual documentation that George Taylor was helped by Milligan to get to Windsor. What we do know is that in the stories uh, by Milligan and, the, in, and what was printed in the Denison, Kansas uh, church um, information, was that uh, when George came back to Southfield, he started to work with Milligan for Milligan uh, and that uh, Milligan had helped him uh, when he had come back to Southfield. So we can't say 100%, uh, but we can kind of, with the connection, see that Milligan was probably one of those who helped George get to Windsor. Uh, and uh, when Milligan had to go to Kansas, it was 1870-71, so this is after the end of slavery, um, he wanted somebody to bring his family later, so his wife and I think there were six children, um, and, you know, whether it was something that George felt he owed to Milligan or because they were good friends. Um, you know, he helped Milligan's family moved to Kansas. Um, and then we do know that George came back for his family uh, because in the 1880 census, they're still in Southfield while Milligan and his family are in Kansas. But sometime after 1880, we do know that he moves his family to Kansas. Why, we don't know. We can only just assume that, um, there was better opportunity perhaps, or uh, there was just that that special friendship between Milligan and George, um, but we don't have any documentation as to exactly why he did go to Kansas, um, but there was definitely strong ties between Milligan and, T and the Taylor family. And I would also like to point out that um, we also noticed that uh, when the Taylors returned to Michigan, when they came back uh, from their stay in Kansas, um, they they left roughly about the same time that Reverend Milligan had left Kansas himself. So there's another uh, thing that leads us to think that it's pr it probably had something to do with their friendship. I have a question. I wondered if um, the Taylors and the Fishes have living descendants today? Yes. So um, that if you watch the YouTube channel, if you go back and watch the Black families of Birmingham, so George and Eliza Taylor never had children of their own that we know of. Um, but Clara Taylor, their adopted daughter, would marry uh, into the Farmer family, who would marry into the Fer Harris family, who would also marry into the Jackson family. Uh, so there are descendants, and that's where we got a lot of information and a lot of photographs, which you can see that we don't have any of George and Eliza, but we do of Clara and uh, the Harrises uh, was through one of the descendants. Um, they would eventually most move to Midland, um, and I'm not sure where the descendant lives today day. Um, but that's in the, the talk from February, which is an excellent talk. And uh, as for fish, uh, there are fish descendants. We have been trying to get in contact with them. Uh, I have sent emails um, and letters, uh, but 
they do exist. They haven't gotten back to us yet. But none in the area, like none of them live in Birmingham anymore. So uh, any other questions? I'll just jump in real quick for anyone who may not have noticed. Um, the, uh, I threw the links to the um, to the YouTube, the museum's YouTube channel for those uh, presentations you meant in the chat. So if anyone doesn't feel like or doesn't get around to Googling the Birmingham Museum of Michigan and, and going through the yeah. black families of early Birmingham is in there. And then from earlier, um, the utter the 1825 Otter Murders Revisited. Oh. So you can click on them before and open them up in a separate tab if you want to save them or watch them later. Yeah, and Leslie T or Leslie Pilek, who uh, did the talk, just uh, entered into the, the comments that Clara Blevins, Taylor Proctor's descendants were located in the Midland area in the early 2000s, uh, but we have not been able to connect with them at this time as well. Uh, but we'll keep trying. <laughs> Maybe one day, though. They'll get back to us. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody wanted to help you out with this historical research, um, are you open to that? Oh, definitely. We're always open for for those who want to help. Um, like we said, Jackie Pat has been a tremendous help just reading the Birmingham eccentrics. <laughs> um, and, and she takes notes for us and sends us clips of uh, interesting facts and articles because the truth is, is with everything else that we're trying to do, including, you know, giving tours and research, sitting down and reading a paper all day is, I mean, I would love to do it, but I can't. Well, <laughs> I can, I can tell you from firsthand experience because I've had to I've had to do this before for another project it is it is something it takes a very long time but <laughs> <Like> it's <months. laughs> but yeah but if it's you know and but there's other research too of looking through newspapers isn't quite your <laughs> cup of tea um but yeah I mean if, if uh if you want to contact us either you know email us call us uh drop in during uh opening we'll definitely uh we can talk to you and and uh yeah we're always looking for volunteers and help 